very few so choose. And I'm going to have you guys scoot back just a little bit. Okay, Elliot, can you scoot back a little bit so that the people behind you can see? And we're going to, um, has anybody seen this box before, by the way? A few of you. Okay. Yeah, a few of you have. We call this the desert box. Sometimes we use this desert box in Sunday school to tell some important stories about God. And so today we're going to hear a story in the desert box, and I invite you all to join in. So we always have to get our minds and our bodies and our hearts ready before we come close to the stories of God. So I invite all of you to take a big, deep breath in and out. And to get your body comfortable, and we will get ready for the story of God. Sometimes Abram would go to the edge of the city and he would look 
look out over all of the sand and the desert, and you would look up at all of the stars in the sky, and you would pray to God. Well, one time Abram was praying, and God came so close to Abram, and Abram came so close to God that he knew God was in this place, too. And Abram knew that it was time to move to another new place. So he and Sarai packed up their belongings and they moved west. This time there was no river to show them the way or to give them animals something to drink. They got to a place called Shechem, went to the top of the hill and prayed to God. They weren't sure if God would be in this place either, but when they prayed, God came so close to them and they felt so close to God that they knew God was there. So they built an altar to remember the place and to say thank you to God for being with them. And then they kept going on their journey. That wasn't where they were supposed to stop. They went to another place and they went up a hill to the right. And up at the top of the hill, they prayed to God again. And God was there. And God came so close to them and they felt so close to God that they knew God was there. And they built another altar to remember that God was there and to give thanks. Now they knew God wasn't just here, or here, or here, but all of God was everywhere. And they finally came into their new home near the Oaks of Mamre. Well, one night, God called Abram out to the edge of the desert. And God told Abram to look at all of the grains of sand in the desert, and all of the stars in the sky, and God said, Abram, promise for you. One day your family will be so great it will be as many as there are grains of sand in the desert and stars in the sky. And Abram just laughed. He and Sarai were too old to have children. How could they have a great family that was that big? But God said it was a promise and as part of that promise, God gave Abram and Sarai new names. Abram Sarai and Sarah. Abraham told Sarah about the promise and she just laughed too. They were too old to become parents, but do you know what happened? They had a baby. <laughs> and when they had the baby, they laughed so much that they decided to name him Isaac, which means laughter in their language. And Isaac grew up When she was old and full of years, Sarah died. And they buried her in a cave near the Oaks of Mamre. Abraham and Isaac were very sad. Soon their family began to grow. When Isaac was grown, he married a kind and wise woman named Rebecca. Dear God, thank you for the stories of family. Thank you that these are our stories. I pray that you would help us to know more about you and more about each other. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
Our scripture text this morning comes from Jeremiah chapter 2, verses 4 through 13. Listen for a word to God. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord. What wrong did your ancestors find in me that they went far from me and went after worthless things and became worthless themselves? They did not say, Where is the Lord? Who brought us up from the land of Egypt? Who led us in the wilderness, in a land of deserts and pits, in a land of drought and deep darkness, in a land that no one passes through where no one lives? I brought you into a plentiful land to eat its fruit and its good things. But when you entered, you defiled my land and made my heritage an abomination. The priests did not say, Where is the Lord? Those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers transgressed against me. The prophets prophesied by Baal and went after things that do not profit. Therefore, once more, I accuse you, says the Lord, and I accuse your children's children. Cross to the coasts of Cyprus and look. Send to Kedar and examine with care. See if there has ever been such a thing. Has a nation changed its gods, even though they are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for something that does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked, be utterly desolate, says the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, and dug out cisterns for themselves, cracked cisterns that can hold no water. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let's pray. Gracious God, thank you for your word. I pray that you would open our ears and our eyes and our hearts and our minds to the message you have for us today. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, when I was two years old, I went to go see the ballet, The Nutcracker. And I loved it so much that it changed my life. I came home after that performance just full of passion and excitement, and even though it was late at night, I could not fall asleep, and I just danced around the living room with my arms up like this, <laughs> and I twirled on our green shag carpet, and I leaped and I spun, and it was so glorious. I knew I wanted to be a dancer. Now, I don't actually remember this, but I feel like I do. And I feel like I do for two reasons. First, because I have a photo. Mm -hmm. This was the day, and I'll keep this out after so you can see it, but this was the day, the moment. And yes, there really is green shy carpet. Isn't that, isn't that classy? <laughs> and I feel like I remember this because of the stories that my parents told me about it. This experience shaped me and the stories that they told, the way they told that story over and over and over again helped me become who I am. I did go on, they signed me up for ballet classes after this and it became my life's first passion and Many years later, I danced with the Colorado Ballet Company, and this was the story, this was the origin story that they always told about why. Some memories are our own, and some have been passed down to us. But either way, they shape us. The stories that we tell ourselves shape us. I'm sure you have some of your own. What are stories that your family tells over and over? What are stories that our community, that our country tells over and over and over? What are stories this church tells over and over and over? I wonder if they're good stories or hard stories. A little bit of both. To remember our stories is to remember God's work in our lives. In fact, I actually consider the practice of remembering to be a spiritual practice. 
And scripture, scripture backs this up more than 300 times in the Bible. We are called to remember or to not forget something. Remember how I brought you out of Egypt. Do not forget the words of Jesus. Remember what your ancestors did. Do not forget who I am. Our text today from Jeremiah is a harsh judgment on the people of God because they have not remembered and have turned away from God. So the prophet shares these words of God in this time leading up to exile because the generations after Moses have forgotten their story of liberation. They've stopped telling it, and now the people have turned away toward worthless things. Did you notice in the text what God's direct accusations are? An accusation, by the way, is, is the right word. This text is written in legal language to sort of set up this image of a courtroom where God has brought the people in and accused them of breaking their part of the covenant. And there are three accusations that God brings. First, you have chased after worthless things, things that have no value or real profit. Two, you have stopped asking, where is God? And three, you did not remember. Remembering is a spiritual practice. Remembering our own story, our family story, our collective story, across generations. Because when we remember, it allows us to ask, where is God? Where was God? Where might God be going next? Frederick Buechner was the great author, theologian, Presbyterian minister who uh, recently died, just a couple of weeks ago, actually. And he has a famous quote that you will likely recognize that always brings tears to my eye. In fact, I, um, I wrote this quote in our daughter Naima's uh, baby, baby book journal right before she was born. The quote is this. The grace of God means something like here is your life. You might never have been, but you are, because the party wouldn't have been complete without you. Here is the world. Beautiful and terrible things will happen. Don't be afraid. I am with you. If we tell stories, and if we remember enough, there will be both beautiful and terrible things. Stories of triumph and stories of failure. Times when God felt so close and times when we weren't sure if God was there at all. And our call is to remember anyway. This is actually one of the reasons I love scripture so much. It tells the story of God and God's people, both the beautiful and the terrible. The Bible is not just a highlight reel of all of the people getting it right and doing wonderful things and praising God so well. It tells stories of prayers of desperation and critiques of God and stories of disciples that get it right and help people and stories of them totally missing the point and causing harm. It reminds us of people triumphing and then also reminds us that sometimes those who are brought out of desperation become oppressors themselves. The Bible tells it all. We tend to have selective memory and not want to remember the terrible stories. But God is in them too. We can see our, our desire for this selective memory in uh, the issues that our country is facing right now. And particularly, I was thinking this week about uh, critiques of critical race theory and books being banned that deal with anything slightly negative in American history. And that argument that people say is, well, we, we'll lose a sense of American pride and identity if we only dwell on the dark parts of our past. Not even if we only dwell on those parts, but if we mention them, then, then people are going to get discouraged. We should only look to our success and generate new generations who are proud to be Americans and who will work for positive forward momentum. But that's a harmful and deeply problematic approach that completely misses 
the point of what education is about and what real history is, and it discounts the humanity of generations of people. Many folks have looked to Germany to refute this idea of ignoring the nation's sin and looked particularly to how they deal with the history of the Holocaust. And folks have pointed out that Holocaust education is mandatory for students in Germany, and indeed many of them visit concentration camp sites, Holocaust museums, and, and learn about it in their curriculum. But what I find most interesting are the ways that Germany talks about the terrible stories just through its own people, not because it's mandated on high from the government. There was a movement of people in the late 60s that began to uh, sort of discover the depths of how terrible the Holocaust was. And many of these people at that time had parents who were part of it, or who witnessed it at the very least. And so they had wanted to kind of cover it up, but this group of people said, no, this is important that we talk about. And this movement sort of caught on at a grassroots level, and it became very people-led that the stories were brought up and the history was not hidden. And one of the ways that this plays out even still today is through this amazing art installation. It's called Stumbling Stones Project. Maybe you've heard of it if you've traveled in Germany. But the Stumbling Stones Project is the world's largest decentralized monument. It was created by a German artist whose idea was that the places where people were impacted by the Holocaust needed to be marked. And so he created these little stones, little stumbling blocks that had a brass plaque on top. And these were to be put at the sites of the last known residents of people who were impacted by the Holocaust, whether they were killed or persecuted or whatever it might be. And so at those locations, this is why it's so spread out, wherever people were and lived, worked, he would place these plaques. And they would say, here lived so-and-so, with the dates of their, life, of their life on there. But the beautiful thing about this project is that it wasn't just the one artist who said, I'm going to do this, I'm going to put them everywhere. He sort of created the idea and began it, and then he opened it up to the people. And the people of Germany began to do the research and the thinking and participated in the project. So they would research their own homes or their own places of employment or places that they went a lot. And they would do the history, do the research, and figure out if there had been people that lived there that were impacted by the Holocaust. They do the research, then they would fill out this application form and pay a fee and have uh, the opportunity for this monument piece to go into their home. And so from this movement, it came from the people to say, hey, this is important that we remember here lived so-and-so, that we connect our very land to the stories and the people that were here. Even though it is not a wonderful memory to rehash, it's important that we tell these stories. Here lived. Welcome to the world, beautiful and terrible things have happened and will happen. And yet God is here. Jeremiah calls the people of God to attention. They had not been remembering their collective stories or asking, where is God? They'd fallen away from God. I think when we hear the phrase, fallen away from God, what we imagine is, oh, the people stopped going to church. They stopped going to temple. They stopped worshiping. But here's what's fascinating. For Jeremiah, to fall away from God doesn't have as much to do with worship or temple or devotion. Falling away from God has to do with not maintaining justice. Jeremiah talks about this all throughout his book, that knowing God, that telling the stories of God is equated with doing justice. So this accusation of people not knowing God doesn't mean that they're 
not still doing sacrifices or going to the temple or going through the motions. It means that they had stopped promoting justice. They had mistreated widows and orphans and immigrants. That was the sign that the people hadn't been looking for God or remembering their story, the lack of justice. So Jer Jeremiah reminds them of the good news of liberation, reminds them of their whole story, the story that goes all the way back to Abram and Sarai and even before that. And even in the midst of this accusation from God, God still claims them. God calls them my people again and again. Even when the people stop asking where is God, God is there. We today say that we have been grafted into the great family tree. And we are called to remember these roots together and to tell our stories because it leads us to justice. It reminds us what it's like to be in need of help, in need of grace. And all we can do is reach out in justice as a response. I wonder what the most important stories are for us to remember. About ourselves, about our families, about our church, <coughs> about our country, about our God. I wonder how you might be a part of that story telling, both the beautiful and the terrible things. As we end, consider for just a moment, where is God today? Let us be people who seek and who tell stories and who practice remembering. Will you pray with me? Holy God, in this life, beautiful and terrible things happen. And you are here. Help us to be people that never stop looking and never stop remembering. In Jesus' name.